slide here? Yep. Okay, so uh, parametric functions have the form. Uh, X and Y are both individual functions of T. So what's our independent thing here? So all functions are based on some independent quantity and a dependent. So, so we put values in or something goes in and something then comes out, right? So what's our independent thing in a parametric function? Uh, t. t, right? So t is our independent variable. And for different values of t, we get what? What comes out? What's the dependent entity? Both f of t and g of t, which act as a function. Yeah, so then we get, in this, in this parametric function here, we get an ordered pair. So values of t, for every value of t that you put in, you get a corresponding ordered pair of an x and y t together, right? Sim uh, x and y that occur simultaneously for that value of t. All right, so we said independent variables t, dependent variables x and y. And then what about the graph? So where typically how will this graph, what will be the quantities on the axes when we graph this? So w which is the t-axis? Is the t-axis the horizontal or the vertical axis? The t-axis. Uh, it's not small. Right, so it's neither, right? So, so the t-axis, there is no t-axis. Um, it's t is this quantity, like when you look at the graph, it's kind of a behind the scenes variable, right? And so we have our typical xy graph, which you normally dis display in the xy plane, and then t is behind the scenes to generate points x and y. So we're still graphing points x and y, it's just now that both x and y are together are the dependent quantity rather than x being the independent and y being the dependent like you're used to from before. Okay, so let's review. Let's maybe now start just talking a little bit about calculus here. I haven't talked about any calculus yet. So what's the meaning of dy dx? which is the rate of change of y with respect to x. So this is review. This has nothing to do with parametric functions here. If dy dx suppose was 2.7, what would the meaning of that value be? And so if there were a handful of things that were the most important for me, for you to come away with this in the, cor in the course, one of these would be this, that you could, you could give a good articulate answer as to what a rate of change means. So anybody remember so everyone should remember but my experience is that this does not come easily so we've worked hard on this what does the rate of change of 2.7 mean uh, given a small change in x the, the corresponding change in y is 2.7 times dx okay you made my day okay so that was, that was well said right that was awesome Given any change in x, given any change in the independent variable, and specifically uh, a small change, right? A small change in, in x, the corresponding change in the dependent variable will be 2.7 times as much as that change in x. So let's just. Okay, so it, what, it's, it's how fast y is changing with respect to x. In this case, y is changing 2.7 times as fast as x. So if you had a little change in x, the resulting change in y would be 2.7 times as much as that change in x. So this all wrapped up in this number is this, this kind of complicated uh, 
This, this quantity is, is telling us how fast y is changing with respect to x. And this is how we make sense of it. For a small change in x, y will change, in this case, 2.7 times as much as x. Okay, so then, so now let's talk about parametric functions. So with parametric functions, we could have uh, dx dt and dy dt. So what would dx dt mean in parametric functions? Somebody new. Displacement in t. Displacement in t. Oh, sorry. Are you asking us the expression? In so, so I want to know what what a value so of dx dt was some value, right? Dx dt took on a value. What would that value mean? Given any small change. Okay. Small change in x would be the rate of change times d of a small change. Oh, okay. So two of you know it. Uh, it's great, and I'm sure many more also. But yes, given us now this means given a small change in t, right? So given a change in our independent variable t, the resulting change in x, the x coordinate would be that rate times as much as the ch small change in t that you picked. Similarly, dy dt, given any change in t, the change in y would be the rate of change times as much as the change in t. Okay, so that's, so we can apply the same meaning to rate of change when it comes to parametric functions as we can the y as a function of x that we did before. It's just now that there's two first derivatives. There's dx dt and dy dt. Both of these x and y are changing at some rate with respect to t, according to whatever the function is. OK, any questions on this kind of review of parametric functions and maybe just taking a dip here into the calculus a little bit? Okay, so the idea with parametric functions is now we can uh, we can model all kinds of curves that we couldn't model before with uh, y as a function of x. So let's take a look at some examples here. Okay, is it a function? Is this curve a function? Yes. Okay, I said, someone said yes. So uh, yes, how is this curve a function? How, how do you say yes, this, is a, this curve is a function? I guess not looking at it from the vertical line test perspective, we can see that there are two functions, sine of and then cos of for the x and y values. Okay. So what is the what is our definition of a valid function? What what does it mean for it to be a valid function? So we can conclude that as t is varying quote unquote behind the scenes, we are getting in outputs for our two functions which are labeled as x and y. Okay. Right? What well, everything you said is perfectly right, but but it's the, what makes it a valid function, you didn't hit on what actually makes a function valid as a function. Every input gives exactly one output. Right, so for every value of the independent entity, so we can we'll call it entities now, there's exactly one Uh, resultant of the dependent entity. For everything that for everything that goes in, there's only one corresponding out. For everything that goes in, there's only one corresponding thing that comes out. 
So how is how is this then a function? Um, both x and y are functions of t. So for every input of t, there's an output of x and y in the form of an ordered pair. Yeah, well said. Right. So for every t that you could pick, you only get one ordered pair. You only get one corresponding ordered pair x and y, and that's shown right here. So pick a value of t. You're only going to get one value of x and then one corresponding value of y, so that every t gives one ordered pair. So it's a function if it's a parametric function. How is this not a function? How, what's one way you could, can, one perspective on this where you could say, oh, no, that's not a function? If x was the independent variable. Right. And, and deep, what would the dependent be? Y. Y, right? So y is not a function of x because there are x values that give two different y's, right? In fact, almost every x value here. So, like, I think, yeah, so, so any x, really any x value that you pick here, there's two corresponding y's for that x. So ordered pairs x and y are a function of t, but y is not a function of x because there are values of x that give two values of y. So just to ask, is it a function, you can't really answer that. You need more information. What question are you asking? Is our ordered pairs a function of t? Is y a function of x? What about is x a function of y? We could ask that question. Is x a function of y? Yes or no for this one? No. So x being a function of y means you would start with what? You'd start with... What's the independent if you're saying x, you're asking if x is a function of y? So now y is independent, and you're saying for every y that you pick, is there one corresponding x, yes or no? No. No. Here's an example of a y value that you pick. There's two x's corresponding to that y. So neither y is a function of x, nor is x a function of y. But ordered pairs are a function of t, according to this function, parametric function right here. Does that make sense? All right, and so then you, you can get all kinds of, you can model all kinds of curves in the xy plane that weren't functions before. And they're functions parametrically. So here's a rather simple parametric function, t plus sine 2t, t plus sine 3t, but it looks nothing like functions that you're used to from your math, math history, right? So, so we never, you never, didn't really see anything like this, okay? But it's a valid function if you could say, you could say that ordered pairs x and y are a valid function of t according to this parametric definition. Okay, is y a function of x? No. Certainly not. There's values of x that give two values of y. Is x a function of y? Also no. Also no. Right? All you need is one value of y that gives more than one x, and that's easy to find. But, is it, it, couldn't it be a function? Yes, because it's in terms of t. Right, because for every value t, so it, if you say ordered pairs, x and y, are a function of t. Because for every t, you only get one ordered pair. And it's okay to get the same ordered pair more than once, right? So there's two values of t there that give the same ordered pair. That does not violate the definition of a function. You can get the same ordered pair. It's just that when you pick a t, there can only be one ordered pair corresponding to that t. That's the, that's the rule. Different values of t giving the same ordered pair is not a violation of that. It's just that you need one ordered pair per t.
All right. So let's uh, how about this one? Here's a parametric function. X is one plus three t. Y is two minus t squared. I want you to think about this. Is is it a is it a valid function? Is this the graph of a valid function? Yes. Is my question complete? No. Okay. So my question could be complete, but the answer then the answer yes, just yes or just no would be incomplete, right? So so is it is it a valid function? So suppose the answer is yes. Well, that's not really a complete answer. What would a complete answer be? Somebody knew. Yes, because for every value of t there's only one ordered pair. Okay. Okay, every t gives one x, y. Is there another way to answer this question? Is it a function? Yes, because every value of x gives one value of y. Oh, so this one is, given an x, do you get one y? Every time? So that has to be true every single time. Given an x value? That's what we see so far. Yeah, good. All right, so based on what I'm showing you, that certainly seems like it's true, but not not a full proof. But yes, it sure seems like every x is only giving one y, so we'll just go with that. All right, is there a way to say no, this is not a function? Yeah, y is not a function of x. Is that what you mean to say? Or like the inverse, sorry. Yeah. So like for every t, or for every y, there's not one value of x. Uh, so we say there, there exists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. x is not a function of y. Because there's a there exists at least one y that gives two x's. One well, and, and there's in fact many, but all you need is one, one y that gives two x's. So here it looks like what well, we know that given a t, we only get one ordered pair. So uh, ordered pairs are a function of t. Um, it looks like y is a function of x, but we know for sure that x is not a function of y. All right. So how can we confirm this? I want to confirm that indeed y is a function of x. And so that we're just kind of assuming that from the picture, but how can I confirm for sure that y is a function of x? We can make the formula that is, or the equation that is two minus t to the second in terms of x by using the equation given to us that uh, 1 plus 3t is x. Yeah, very good. So we can do some, let's do some algebra here. And if we can eliminate t, if we can create an equation of just x and y from these two with t eliminated, then that can help us confirm that when we get, when we have a, an equation of x and y, that we can recognize it as a valid function or not. So how can we do that? We could take the this, and so this is like the idea of solving a system of equations. We're trying to eliminate t, so we could use substitution. What does t equal here? x minus 1 over 3. x minus 1 all over 3, right? If we solve that for t, we'd subtract 1 and then divide by 3. And then what can we do? 
and put that in the y equation. Yeah, well, so then we can take y. the t and put it here. So we'd have y equals 2 minus so one, so one, 3 squared. And look, t is gone. And so the question is, is this a valid function? For every x that I pick, do I get exactly one y? Yes. Yeah, so if, when you put an x in here, you subtract one, you divide by three, you square it, you take two minus that, you're only gonna get one value, right? You're only gonna get one value. So, and this is a quadratic function, right? So this is quadratic. And that kind of that kind of confirms what we saw in the picture. For every x, there's only one y. So this is a this is a technique here to change it from a parametric function into an equation of x and y. And then sometimes that equation in y will confirm that y is a function of x. But sometimes the equation of y, x and y will be the curve of something that's not a function. So that just because we can eliminate t and get an equation of x and y doesn't guarantee that we have a function, y is a function of x. But in this case, we can confirm a, a simple you know, quadratic function. Okay, any questions? All right, so what's the difference between the parametric version of the function and the non-parametric or the y is a function of x? What's the difference? Is it that t's in our input anymore? Okay. Yeah. So the different one difference would be that here you have a here your x is your input and y is your output. Here t is your input and ordered pairs are your output. So that's a difference. How about what's the same about them? What's the same about those two? So you're a little quiet. I couldn't really make out what you said. Y is still acting as our dependent variable. That's our output. Okay, but that's here. It's X and Y are dependent. So what what is the same about them? They are both functions. They're both functions. For every value of the um, independent variable, there's only one resulting dependent variable. Okay, so that you could say that that's true. You could say that about any two functions, right? But so, what's the same about these particular? Well, they yield the same graph. Right, you get the same points. You get the same x y ordered pairs, right? And you get the same graph. Okay, but then there's a difference about how those points are generated. So let's, we'll see that in the next example. Okay, so these are two, they're different functions, they're different types of functions, but they're both yielding the same set of points that are graphed. Okay, so let's look at, oh, sorry. Thing here first. Okay. All right, how about this one? So x equals 8t minus 3, y is minus 6t minus 2. And so can you find an equation of y and x taken together? So can you can you resolve this and eliminate t and find the equation of y and x to see if we have y as a function of x? Let's do that. So can you do that? Yes. Go for it. 
Okay, so first I'll start with, I guess, the x. So x equals to 8t minus 3. Mm -hmm. And if we're solving for t, we'll get something like x plus 3 all over 8. That equals to t. And now that we have t as a value, in a way, we can input that in our system. Like, we can use the system of equations and put that in negative 6 and then x plus 3 over 8, bracket closed, minus 2. So negative 6, x plus 3 over 8, minus 2. And maybe let's do some simplification here. So it looks like I'm going to have negative 3 fourths x. That's 6 over 8. Um, I just have a question. So when we're doing the y, when we're substituting, um, like we're solving for t and then we're substituting it in, is that only because we're trying to see if it's a function or like if we're trying to prove it? Um, that's part of it, but um, the main thing is we're just, we wanted to have an equation just of y and x together. And then from that, we can ask the question is, it can help us answer the question is, is y a function of x? Okay, thank you. But so yeah, we're just changing the form, changing the form of this function into st simply an equation of x and y without t in it anymore. And then yeah, part of that is then we can analyze, we can look at that and say, is, is y a function of x? Okay, thank you. Sure. So simplifying this, I get negative 3 fourths x. And this looks like, what is this? Uh, this is negative 16 eighths, so we get negative 34 eighths. And is that... 17 fourths, check my math. Yeah. Okay, so we got y equals negative 3 fourths x minus 17 fourths. Is, it, is y a function of x? Yes. Yes, and what kind of function? Linear. Uh, linear function. Linear function, okay. And so notice, our, both our x and y were linear functions of t. And so when both x and y are linear functions of t, x and y will also be uh, in linear relationship. Uh, so, but then there, you could get a vertical line. So just be careful, there's some maybe some exceptions to that rule. But uh, so here's that. So we expect that when we graph, so this is a y-intercept of negative 17 fourths and a, a slope of negative three-fourths, or rate of change, right, rate of change. Um, so if I graph both of these, I'm expecting to get that same line. So let's, I'll do this one in blue. So there's, I've graphed the parametric function, and it's looking like the y-intercept is correct. We got a negative slope. And then I'll do this one in red and they land on top of each other. So it's the same set of points, same set of points. Okay? But what is different? The fact that T is involved here, what's different about how the line is, how the points are generated, right? So how the points are generated. Well, the the par ordered pairs are formed as T varies in the parametric function, um, but the line for the regular as x is a function of y um, is generated as x varies. Good. Nice. And so, yeah, so what happens with a parametric function is Wow, is that slow? Really? That's probably why. This. All right, so with a parametric function, as t varies, so here's t down here. So right now it's 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. 
So let's make that bigger. There we go. Okay. So as so here's that function t is varying here. So here's t taking on different values. As t takes on values, points are points are generated. And so what happens with a parametric function is you have a direction that for increasing t. So the direction of this parametric function is this way. As t increases, points are generated here from upper left to lower right. And I'm showing you that. like this. So we never really never really thought about why is a function of x is having a direction to the curve. I mean, I guess you could think of it as always left to right. But with these parametric curves, an important aspect of them is what's the direction of the curve as t increases? How do the points get generated for increasing t? And so for this one, they, they are generated kind of down and to the right as t increases. All right, so now suppose we had started with this linear function and we wanted to come up with um, a parametric function for it. So notice 8t minus 3 minus 6t minus 2. Do you see any, anything that looks remotely like that by looking at this, right? Negative 3 fourths x minus 17 fourths. It seems like a pretty big stretch. Like there's seems like there's no connection. We know it's the same set of points, but to, to get from here to here would be like, how would we do that? It doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any relationship between these values and these. So one really, one strategy for writing a parametric function given y is a function of x is to simply let x equal t. And if x equals t, then what would y equal? Negative 3 fourths t minus 17 over 4. Isn't that a parametric function of t? And won't it generate the same set of points as this line? Because if x is t, then y is negative 3 fourths x minus 17 fourths. It's the same thing. So here is, this is one strategy. It's not the, it's definitely not the one size fits all strategy, okay? If you have a polynomial or linear function or some, some kind of simple y is a function of x where you have a formula like this, this is often a valid strategy for writing it as a parametric function. Let x be t or whatever your independent variable is, let that one be t. And then your dependent variable will just have the same form of the formula that your original function did. Okay, so now if I were to graph this parametric function, what would I see? So now I'm going to turn off. I'm going to turn off the the y is a function of x version, maybe. And there's my blue, my, that's my original form of the parametric function. And I'm going to so for these parametric functions, you, it, it, you're going to use the same thing you did before in GC to get a point, which was control two. Control two represents a point or an ordered pair. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're specifying points as ordered pairs, each as a function of t. So now we're going to let x be t, and we're going to let y be negative 3 fourths, t minus 17 fourths. And lo and behold, we get the same, we get the same graph.
So this is one for these set of points. This is one parametric function. And this is another. Are these the same parametric function or a different parametric function? Are these different functions or the same function? They might have different directions. Okay. So if they had a different direction, would that make them the same or different functions? The same function, but expressed through different, through different expressed differently. Okay, I have one vote for that they're the same function. Anyone want to argue that they're different functions? They're different. And why? Because for uh, the same value of t, they give different outputs. That's right. So the, if it were the same function, then putting in the same t into both would give the same ordered pair every time. So when t equals 0, what ordered pair do we get from this graph? Negative 3, negative 2. And when t equals 0 in this one, what do I get? 0, negative 17 over 4. Totally different ordered pair. And uh, let's do t equals 4, make our life easy here. When t equals 4, what order pair do I get from the first one? Is that 29, negative 26, check my math. And what about here? 4, and then you have negative 3. 3 minus yeah. 17 fourths, like negative 29 yeah. fourths. So that's... Uh, Negative 12, yeah, I think that's negative 29 fourths. All right, so values of t give different ordered pairs, so that, that's why they're a different function. So there are different, there are different functions, but what's the same about them? The graph. Yeah, the range, right? So, so when you put in all values of t into both, you get the same ordered pairs. The whole set of ordered pairs is the same. So individual t's give different ordered pairs, but put in all real values for t into both, and you get the same set of ordered pairs, which is represented by this line. Okay, another aspect to, to argue why these are different is, let's take a look at this. What is, for this function here, what is dx dt? What's dx dt? Eight. What's dx dt for this one? One. What is this telling us about how these functions are different? The fact that dx dt for this one's eight and dx dt for this one is one. Um, x changes eight times faster in the first function. If what, for, for, yeah, eight times faster for? For as t varies. Yeah, so it's like, as t varies, this, this function, right, is gonna, it's gonna kinda like, you think about it, it's gonna like generate the points or have show changes in x eight times as much as this one. Right, so you change t a little bit, you're gonna get a bigger span of, of points, eight, eight, a, eight times wider span of x values of points than you will here. Here you get a span of only one as, as t changes. Yeah, so for any change in, any small change in t, your span of, span of points over an x is gonna be eight times greater in this one than it will be the span of points generated in this one. And we could, we could argue the same thing about dy. We could do dy dt and look at the same thing. So if I were to come down here, so we get the blue line and the red line. So let's do red. Make our radius a little bigger. And so watch. Watch what happens. So the red is the second. And the blue is the first. So as t increases, 
as t increases, we get x changes eight times as much as the change in t for this graph, for this version of the function. But for this version of the function, x changes the same amount as t, right? For any change in t, x is going to change the same amount, one times as much. So for changing t, this is kind of what, how the, what it looks like, how those points are generated in the two different functions. Does it make sense? <clears throat> Any questions on that? But if you let, again, if you let t be all real, if you t let t be all real values in both, in the end, you're going to get all the same set of points, every ordered pair on this line. Um, I just had a question. Does the dy dt matter in this case, or just the dx dt? No, it, it matters just as much. It's just we didn't talk about it. So what is dy dt? Negative six and negative three fourths. So for every change in t in this first version, changes in y are negative six times as much as the change in t. Whereas in this version of the, the graph, the, the set of points, for every change in t, the corresponding change in y is negative three fourths times the change in t. Again, a lot slower generation of points. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing the generation of points here is like eight times greater than the generation of points there for a, for a change in t. Okay, let's uh, take a look at something else here. So how about this? Can we, without technology, without GC here, can we um, sketch this? So x is pi over 2t, cosine, or y is cosine pi over 2t. How would we make it without any technology? How what could we a strategy be for sketching this graph? Just making a table and plotting some points, maybe. Okay. So yeah, we could plot points or we could think more through variation, right? Through variation like we've been working on. How could we think about how how the graph is generated through variation rather than just points and connect the dots. Oh, somebody please know this from Monday's lecture and Tuesday's recitation. So we're going to look at the separate graphs of both of them, and we're going to see as t varies what our x and y value are. Okay. I mean, what the value is. And then looking at sine pi over 2t is our x-axis. So we'll then we'll graph that point. Okay, so how are we going to, how are we going to uh, find how x and y vary as t varies? What's, so, yeah, we can look at the graphs. So x is sine, y is cosine. And so um, we know that as t varies from zero to one, that x um, will vary from zero to one as well. Good. So I don't want to do this t. t varies from 0 to 1. What does x do? x varies from? So sine, so go from 
sine of 0 to sine of pi over 2. And that's right here. So x will go from what to what? 0 to 1. 0 to 1. And y will go from? One to zero. One, One to zero. zero, right? So cosine, as we go from zero to pi over two, that's t going from zero to one. Cosine will go from one to zero, right? So we start at zero, one. And then as t varies, x is going to increase to one and y is going to decrease to zero. Will it be like a straight line like this? No, it's going to be a curve. Yeah, it'll be a curve because we got sine and cosine. So let's just watch that happen here. So as t goes from 0 to 1, x goes from 0 to 1, and y goes from 1 to 0. And then we could continue that way. And what do we get? Just the units are... Right, so if you remember, your, our definitions of sine and cosine are coordinates on the unit circle. So if you set x and y equal to sine and cosine, you're going to get the unit circle.